Hello. Hello. So we live in Liberia right now because we're adopting two little girls from Liberia, but we're gonna move back to the U.S. Yep. Um, Monday. So. Yes. Um, I'm actually so today actually there was, it, it was kind of a hard day. I mean it was a really hard day, but it was kind of an expectedly hard day. Um, I cried really ugly, snotty, like blubbery tears. I was totally fine. Like I was in this like glistening tear on my cheek <clears throat> place. And then I hugged one of the nannies. Her name is Esther. And I hugged her and I just, then I just lost it. I was like, Rosie, thank you so much. And it was just like, all the kids just looked at me. It was just dead silent. And, um, I, I hugged our kids and then Jeremy went in for the, I was just going to wave at everyone else. And I was holding myself together because I think my composure is important because I'm not sure that all the kids understand what's going on. And then Jeremy went in for the hug with Esther and I was like, oh no. Mm -hmm. And one of the nannies waved Jeremy off. Jeremy is a big hugger. I, I like hugs. I'm not going to turn down a hug, but I'm not like going to be the hug initiator. Like I'm just, I mean, I'll side hug someone if I feel like it's socially appropriate, but like I'm not a natural like, I like hugs. If you want to hug me, please hug me. Don't hold back. I like it. Um, but I'm not the hug initiator. I don't need hugs. Jeremy needs them. It's part of his personality. Hug me. Part of his love languages. Um, but then after he hugged Esther, I'm like, well, now it's weird if I don't hug her. And I just could feel, like, just my heart breaking. So. Yes. So I lost it after I hugged Esther. And then I had to blubber myself to the car first without my family. Because I just can't just fall down on the ground in the gravel and just scream so yeah i think the nanny that waved, i got in the car the with our driver off, i think she just didn't want to get emotional so she she's was, yeah she was she was getting it i could so, see it in her face yeah um but then i just kind of kneeled down and told our liberian daughters that you know i was going to miss them and think about them every day and yeah that this wasn't forever and that you know mom's going to come back and get you and they seemed prepared and they were fine and they didn't, nobody got car sick. We actually gave them a little bit of car ride medicine this time. Cause there's a lot of twists and turns, um, <laughs> today and today there was a ton of flooding. So I'm going to pause right here and put in some of the flooding videos and then I'll come right back. Well, that is a lot of flooding. It was like houses almost on underwater. The river floods. Probably washed away some of the trash. They know to get out. So that building's underwater. It's about three, about, about a foot and a half, maybe. Yeah. Does this area always flood? Always floods, yeah. Why don't they move? No, they can't. They probably can't afford to move. This storm that's coming through here is the one that they're watching um, to hit the states as a hurricane. Yeah, like the rain we're getting here, and it's coming off the coast of, of West Africa. It's, it's going to end up hitting. They're already watching it, yeah. So this last like week, it's going to make this big wave in the ocean. It's going to hit. It's not going to hit us, but...
Okay, so flooding videos. And some of the, I know the video quality is kind of poor because I'm like in my, the front pack. I mean, I'm like bouncing around as we're driving. There were some fights. I don't know if you saw the fights breaking out. Um, I'm pretty sure someone was killed because when we were driving back, um, there was a kind of military looking vehicle and it was loading up like something that, I mean, basically a body bag, but kind of wrapped in like a trash bag type situation. I think they were loading dead bodies. It was like a military personnel. It was a military too, right? personnel, but they also had Red Cross emblems, um, like the, similar to the Red Cross <clears throat> emblems. Um, uh, it was probably like a, a failed search and rescue. So the flooding was up to, up to a grown man's chest. So, and then there was those guys you probably saw in their, basically their underwear, um, swimming through the water, trying to help cars pass and hoping for a tip. Um, then, you know, that's just what they do. So Emmanuel told us that it, it floods every year. Um, in that same spot. In the exact same. And he said it'll continue until about September. It'll start to slack off and then October it'll be dry again. Um, so October to like April and then, but May, June, July, um, August, September, it's just, it's flooding. And the way that, so the houses that are there, it's really interesting if you see how they did it. You can tell that someone just paved a road. Like they didn't, you can look at the landscape as you're driving by wet or dry season and see that it's not topographically sound. There's not runoffs. There's not grades to anything it's just literally somebody just came through with a bulldozer and just paved a road and there are some like semblances of gutters i guess i mean not gutters but um ditches Drainage. but they're not they're not they don't work and then they're so the the elevation is incorrect to so the river and the trash everything was just flowing everywhere so you can imagine how unsafe these waters are and also during like malaria season it says peak right now so a lot of people are really sick but when we drove by, there was like a car that was underwater over its hood, like a pickup truck. And then when we came back back through, um, the water had receded down to like the tires. Like the tires were still underwater, but you could see the, the truck bed. Um, but like as we're driving by, I'm like looking at my list. I'm answering all these questions from my American kids and um, talking to our driver, Emmanuel, some too. And he's like, they just, they just came in and just did the road. They didn't look at any of the other ways to do things. They didn't. Nothing was, I mean, it's just not topographically sound. It is not going to work. So the pothole, and because because they didn't level the, probably whatever dirt road underneath before they did, the potholes are ridiculous. So we were coming through this intersection we go through pretty much every time. What do we decide? We've been to the orphanage 54 times. 59. 59 times. No, no, it was 53. 53, 53 times, no, probably. And we went on a couple of Saturdays mixed in. So it's probably more like, I would say probably 62 visits to the orphanage so 62 times we've driven there that's a lot and yes. um so the the but the coming back i mean these people and our american kids especially my middle child she sits in the second row and the other two are in the third row and they have their tablets you know they have their fun things to do while we drive but they brought their cameras today <clears throat> their little just VTech digital cameras more of a toy than a photographer but they were taking videos and pictures of this and just wondering their perspective and just talking to them about how, you know, these towns are so old, but whoever came in and paved the road, it's not like it was a group decision. They don't have like the same kind of tax system and property taxes. They don't, I'm really not a lot of sales tax, a little bit of sales tax. I noticed we had some sales tax today on our um, bill for, so, so here's what we did. So we went and picked up our girls. Yesterday we gave them um, their backpacks that they would have gotten to bring home to America. Um, but since they're not coming home and they got their backpacks anyway. Um, some new shoes, um, like kind of just boat shoes, like uh, Velcro, you know, um, closed toe shoes. They've grown so much. So when I first got here, I actually had tennis shoes for both of them. When I went home to America, I got boat shoes for both of them, but I couldn't, the tennis shoe size, I had a friend of mine send me tennis shoes. One pair of tennis shoes came through another family when they came when I was gone. So anyways, the tennis shoes that I bought for them are actually too small. So in the time that we've been here, their feet have grown. So they both got size two boat shoes um, to wear and all their new clothes. They wore their new butterfly dresses that matched their sisters. And um, my oldest daughter, God love her, she's like, probably pushing five five now she's 11 but she her butterfly dress is like really short and like really tight across the shoulders and she was like mom I don't want to give it away but I don't know if I want to wear it and she's just like she, her body is like a 13 or 14 year old but she's 11 so she didn't want to wear it and I didn't make her but they wanted to wear theirs so the younger kids were matching dresses today 
and we took them to eat at the Royal Grand Hotel. There's a cafe and it's really good. If you're just looking for a day of like, it's a nice restaurant, you can sit down, the, the service is very quick. Um, in the lobby, they have a pizza parlor, they have a um, nail salon, they have a coffee house, and then they have like a bakery. Um, and then the bakery and the coffee house both have like cakes and cookies and stuff. So we were able to buy like four boxes of chocolate chip cookies to take back to the orphanage. Because the girls, I've noticed whenever we've, t we've taken them to get pizza before, pizza and ice cream before. And anytime we bring anything, just for, they share. And they, like the last time we took them to get ice cream, it was in a, a cardboard. So they weren't done. They wanted to take it with them. They waited for it to melt. And as soon as they got out of the car, um, they were sharing their leftover ice cream that was like an hour old with their friends. So I wanted to make sure today that we had something to transition. And it was a good transition. So we had chocolate chip cookies for everybody. We got back. Everyone was waiting on the porch. We were gone for about three or four hours. Because an hour, there, an hour back. But we had walked around a little bit in the hotel lobby. And it was good. And I felt like the, you know, the right way to say goodbye is, first of all, just to not, just to get to stay. But there's no, there's nothing for us to do here that would be helpful for them. And we're, we're anticipating a lot of legal fees um, to, to inspire the Liberian government as well as the U.S. government to let them come home. Um, so... All that being said, I think we did it correctly, as good as we could. They were sad when we left. Um, we did see them tearing up and crying and kind of hugging the nannies as we left. They have such good support there. And we've been talking to them about leaving for like two weeks. So yesterday they got the toys and the fun things. Like they have this bouncy ball that like lights up and I gave them just fun things to do. And uh, gave them some wiki sticks, which they thought were really fun, just easy stuff. And they, you know, the nannies were telling me, like, the nanny that she was um, not there when we gave them the presents. So she told me today she was, she was gone. She was um, with one of the other kids that's still in the hospital. And then she came back and he's doing better, but she just, they're just, you know, parents sharing, trying to figure out how to take care of everybody. So she was there. She's like, the first thing I walked in the door, they were like, come look, come look. They were so proud of their stuff and so grateful for it. Um, but basically they have like, a five day wardrobe like they have pjs for five day. i mean everything that they would have needed if they were living with us but they those clothes fit exactly now so they'll they're gonna outgrow them so whenever we come back um you know they'll need new stuff which is fine but it's sad to think that they're gonna grow and they're yeah. gonna miss things um but as our as our um, american kids were talking tonight before they went to bed and saying their prayers and stuff and just kind of decompressing from the day one of them was talking about how they kind of feel guilty because they're watching these people that their homes are just destroyed or flooded and they're carrying their kids on their on their shoulders and just there's nothing and it's like do we help like what do we do to help there's nothing we can do there it's everywhere um and we you know kind of had our own thing we had to do today but it's just this emergency setting it's like it's like a hurricane aftermath but it's like there's nobody on the news like if this were to happen what happened today in liberia if it were to happen in the U.S., people would be coming to help. Like, it's just a different, nobody's, I mean, nobody can help. The government doesn't help. The way the roads are set up and the houses are set up, they're just doomed um, to flood. So, well, just, yeah, and our, my Tennessee mindset, we're driving on the road covered in water, and I'm like, turn around, don't turn drown. Turn around, don't drown. I'm like, we're like, not no. doing that. I'm like, oh, this is, this is kind and of nerve-wracking. There was a truck, basically their axle broke that was carrying, it was a big truck. It's on the video, you probably saw it. It was carrying this huge load of, um, they call it coal, but it's like a brush that burns to cook things. It's a slow burn. Um, and it's often carried, but the road it has so many potholes, it literally broke the axle of the truck and the truck was just stuck there. <clears throat> needed to be towed, um, but you can't tow it I mean, it's just this big thing. And so there were delivery trucks that are like probably like 14 wheel, 12 wheel type wheelbase, but bigger trucks. And they were blocking the road. So like no one could get through. So there's just one truck you could see on the video broken. And then the other truck behind it sideways because they can't get through, but they don't have enough room to turn around and they can't back up because there's a line behind them. So there's no like traffic control. There's no, I mean, it's just like neighborly chaos. So it's just yeah. hard. It's just hard to see and hard to understand that that's that that people died today in Liberia because of flooding. I hope that no kids died today that could have been in that orphanage. That you know, but we were at the um, as we were leaving the restaurant. This is crazy. We um, a, a very nice woman named Lydia Sherman approached us. We never met her. We've heard her name, um, 
but she used to be in charge of adoptions at the Ministry of Gender, and when she was in charge, things were quite efficient from that end. Over the last two years, we've had a lot of problems at the U.S. Embassy, but not out of Liberia. Even um, my friend who, she was um, licensed, and, and um, her document said she could adopt two. Um, she initially started adopting two, and then one child, his family came back to parent him, which was good, so she just was going to adopt one. But kind of towards the end of the process, she um, decided to adopt a little boy. Since she was still licensed for two, they had, but they still had to start his paperwork. Well, under Ms. Um, Sherman's leadership, his paperwork was um, actually expedited um, start to finish since he was going to now be a part of a, a non-biological sibling set. Um, her paperwork was done with just a few little details, and um, she was, thir you know, 13, but he was um, seven. And um, so he was able to, his whole process was done in five months, would have been done in five months. His American family had to travel two months after the first opportunity. So they could have gone in April, but it really just didn't work with all the other kids and schedules and financially trying to be off work and all that. So they had to go in June instead of um, April. But seven months from the time that his family accepted his referral till he's standing in Tennessee. So not that all of them went that fast, but it can be done. And um, that was under Ms. Sherman's leadership. Now, she's no longer in that role um, because of the presidential change. She did not keep her appointment there since she was from a different regime. So whenever they have elections, a lot of times they will change the staff. They did appoint her replacement who has been kind to us and communicated with us, but not quite been the um, pillar of protection um, that Ms. Sherman was for so many years, for 12 years, I believe that she was, she was in that regime at some capacity. Um, but she approached us, introduced herself to us, inquired about our family and our adoption. I mean, obviously we're two white people standing in this expensive hotel, getting in the SUV with a driver. Um, and you know, we have, you know, two white kids and three black kids with us. Um, kind of so stand out. she inquired as to who we were. She introduced herself, inquired as to who we were. Jeremy um, told she, she is she's actually met with Sam Bruce. So she she was very kind to us. Um, she asked what what was happening with the situation because it's not not her field anymore. She's moved on to a different area of, of expertise and work. But she was encouraging. Um, she she had recommendations that we'll pass along to our director and recommendations for us personally that we'll take to heart. Um, but it was kind of her to speak to us, and I did ask her. Um, it was kind of hard to speak to after we've gone to the MOG and been received with some type of hospitality and compassion, but the less results we got, we didn't really change our posture, but we're no longer really welcome there because they can't help us. I don't know if they feel guilty or they're just not as welcoming, whereas she was very open today and welcoming and her recommendations were solid. She, I, I, she allowed me to introduce her to our Liberian daughters who were kind of like deer in the headlights, but we were, we were getting in the car. And she saw us as a family, and I told her, you know, they've been living at the orphanage, but we've been living here close by for five months, and we've been disappointed with the progress. And she just shook her head. Um, yeah, she seemed genuinely bothered. Yes, and it was just not, even if she can't do anything, it's just nice today. Yeah, to have somebody in your corner a little bit, you know. Somebody to say, like, <clears throat> a Liberian leader in government to look at us and say, it's not right. And I said, do you think this will get better? And he, she said, yes. But she said, I said, what do you recommend? What would you recommend? What would help? And she told me. And we'll, we'll be passing that information along once we kind of get our, our bearings um, as to what needs to happen. And hopefully the leadership at our agency will follow through with that. Um, so that was good. But um, it was just... You know, one of my American daughters was talking today about how she felt guilty looking at these people that are basically losing everything right before our eyes. And she sees the kids in the orphanage and she feels a little bit guilty. And I'm like, you know, it's not guilt that you should feel um, because it's not you shouldn't you, have, you didn't do anything wrong to be born in a place of privilege. But with your place of privilege comes certain um, strengths and certain you know superpowers if you will based on your your points i mean we are americans we inherited freedom we inherited um strengths that 
are maintained hopefully by our leadership you know we all have our opinion on how well everybody's doing at that but in its core being an american citizen is a privilege and we do speak from a place of privilege so we talked with our american kids tonight a lot about what that place of privilege means for you and what you can do um for other people because of that and even though we're leaving liberia in you know two three days without the results that we had hoped for when we came we certainly are not leaving empty-handed at all and what our 11 10 and 8 year old have learned from this experience is something that you can't teach in a classroom you can't teach it in a book they have seen the most marginalized vulnerable people in the world and they've made friends with them and they've got a lot of a lot of good ideas. Um, their perspective was extremely helpful for us trying to figure out how to say goodbye to our Liberian daughters. Their advice on what makes sense for kids was invaluable. The things that they will speak on as adults about orphan care and about poverty and about government officials and about corruption and about money and all of those things is something that I'm grateful that they've had the opportunity to experience. I'm grateful that they were able to do it here. I'm grateful that we've had so many of Liberian citizens that have stepped up to become our friends, that have been protective of us, and that we even have friends that, like we really have, a, Tita have met us early on in our trip, um, and William Farr met us early on in our trip. Tita is wonderful, she's a nurse here in Liberia. She was a available to help us with anything um, that we needed. Um, William Farr runs Beautiful Feet, um, which is a nonprofit organization that works with prenatal care and um, crisis pregnancies. And I mean, these are just strangers we didn't even know that we're connected with, not to mention Nelson, Emmanuel, Albert, Esther, like all of these, um, Kubo, all of these, the nannies, Weedor, Debra, and um, Kabe, and Augustine, and Moses, all of the staff at Small World have not just open the door for us but they've opened their hearts and their lives and their own families um the kids have just been obsessed with us we've been celebrities at the small world home and the hobie home as well i mean these people these kids are just looking at us as though we're doing something great and we are even though we're leaving here without the thing that we really wanted it's it's been a privilege to be here wouldn't you say i would I mean, I, I was dreading t today um, for like the last 48 hours because I knew how difficult it was going to be at that moment when we had to say goodbye. I was excited about going out to eat with, with them and having that big experience because their eyes were like... I've never seen. Looking up and seeing like four or five <laughs> huge chandeliers. Chandeliers, yeah. And like It wasn't everywhere. overwhelming. No, 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 it wasn't that, but it's still like it's Just grandiose like a, con compared to what they are used to for sure. It's a hotel restaurant, yeah. Um... And then it's like food service and all that, all that stuff. And it was just, it was a, a treasure to be a part of this that first experience for them. And they did really well. They're very mannerly. And they I, just, they would look and see what I did and they would do it and they would look and, um. Well, and for me, like on the ride back, the, our youngest Liberian daughter like slept on my, on my lap and it's just like, like those laid over moments on her sort of like being able to like put my hands on her and love her. Um, uh, cause it's going to be a while before I can do that again. I'm just, I, I was, I was like. I want to take a picture of it, but it's like just in your head, you know, yeah. just to have that with you always. Cause I mean, we're just going to miss them like crazy. We bonded with them so well. And... Well, one of them, the older one had this kind of, she's had a kind of a mild cough. It's like, just like a, like a, like an allergy type snotty, a little mild cold. A lot of the kids have it right now. I think it's the rain and the dust and everything, but she was trying to stifle a cough. And my middle child looked at her. She was sitting across from her and my middle child stayed really close to them today. Like just, kind of just like a little guide like a little coach she didn't she wasn't overbearing with it or interfered with it but she just she noticed things and she looked at her and she said it's okay for you to cough just cough it's okay cough loud here let me show you and she coughed and I was like I can sing a song while you cough <laughs> I can cough myself really loud but I didn't I knew that she looked a little uncomfortable she's eight but she looked a little uncomfortable like like something was bothering her I'm like I don't know what it is like she may not tell me but middle guest my middle child guess her nickname is middle she guessed and she just that connection and that relatability just made our Liberian daughter smile from ear to ear just just to be known like 
just that that thing. And I think, you know, a lot of people talked about how you really can't bond with them when they're in the orphanage. I disagree. I think returning every day and bonding with them is shows a pattern of consistency and a pattern of um, priority. And so I think I have decided, I don't know, I'll have to cross this bridge when I come to it. The plan is for me to come back to complete their adoption. I've pretty much decided, Jeremy and I have talked about this a lot, um, and there are, you know, we can do like the, the really cheap kind of sketch-ish airline out of Miami that flies straight to Liberia to come and I could come by myself. I mean, I easily could come. I've traveled by myself back here and it's fine and there's plenty of support here for me, but I don't know that I'm going to take them out of the orphanage until they have their visa. And the reason I say that is because I still, I look at the kids that unexpectedly had to go back and I don't fault their parents for that at all. And I'm torn on it. But today I think that they had a really good day with us. I think we're still just novel and new, but we're not the people that they go to when they're grieving. And once they live with you for a few weeks, you're going to become their person they go to when something's wrong. And when you take them back to the orphanage, that's the biggest thing that's wrong. And then they have to go back to people they've said goodbye to. And looking at them today with that solid relationship, that caregiver connection that's not, not had to say goodbye and not been phased out because the Americans are coming, but that solid mom hug that they got and it's not just one of the caregivers it's all of them but like even you know yesterday I was talking to one of the girls that's leaving that I'm that I've become friends with and I know her mom really well and she was so sad and I sat with her she cried you know we had a mo our moment so I've really gotten bonded with them and it's partly because I'm such good friends with their mom and my friendship with their mom has become so much you know more layered and deeper than it would have been if we were just adopting the same kids from Liberia because it's just a shared experience of connection with them but wow while she was tearing up one of the um nannies walked over that's she's been there the longest she's a little bit older and um she's very intuitive she talks to me but not a ton i think my accent or her accent she doesn't interfere she lets us do her thing but she walked over and just stood and was just there and it i'm just i don't think that my advice to the other matched families as we navigate these extremely uncertain waters with adoption is that bonding with them, taking them to lunch, giving them new clothes, giving them new shoes, meeting their friends, meeting what their family has been for the last three, four, five years, some of them. All of them have been there for at least 18 months. So breaking that bond and then having to reforge it to me doesn't make sense. I think you can bond with them enough to bring them home without pulling them out of that, uh, out of that comfort. It doesn't matter about luxury. It doesn't matter about going to the beach or going to the pool or whatever. It matters that when I have to say goodbye, they need that place that they trust without it being muddied by the place that they thought they could trust that's now leaving. It's just, it's going to be hard to leave them there. But I think that until the U.S. Embassy gives me a visa sticker to put on their passport. I think I'm going to let them sleep where they're the most, they, where they feel safe, you know, don't you think? Yeah, I see where you're coming from. But, um, I think just as a mom, if I have to leave them again, I want them to have what they had today. Yeah. Unscathed. Because it very well could be two more trips and those are just kind of like, it's just incremental at this point, you know? It could be years. Yeah. <sighs> or it could get fixed next month. Yeah, you just never know. I mean, I've gone down this dark road that it's we are just going to sponsor them throughout their lives. You know, it's, like it never works out. And we may visit them once a year. We may come over and see them or something. I don't know. It's crazy stuff like that. Um, could be that. End of their adult. But, you know, you just never know. Mm. That's when you just sneak them to Canada. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, if anyone's curious, I did get the big baskets into one suitcase. Very proud of you, by the way. Good job. I had to get my eight-year-old to sit on them as I packed. <laughs> well, first, I wanted them folded up really good, and then I wanted to unfold them and make sure they kept their loft, because I was like, it's just going to work out. And then, I wanted to get them packed in there, but now, the suitcase is a little unbalanced. Um, so... 
I almost wish we would have left their school books for them. Yeah, they wouldn't have been anywhere. I feel bad about bringing their school books home. They're heavy. So tomorrow we are going to do visit Nelson and hang out with his um, his kids, and that's a totally different feel because it is an orphanage. But they're they're not they don't do adoptions. They just they're there forever, and there's thirty of them. So they have a different sense of permanency, which is it's, it's just it's different. You can see it the weight that's not on those kids because they know that this is home forever is is important. Um, so, we're excited. So obviously that'll be like a build up for us. Yeah, it'll be good to see them. I wish we could have seen them more. I mean, we've been very busy here, and then we've been kind of short on money here, so we haven't um, been able to visit them as much as I would have liked. But um, they were and they're busy too. They're very busy. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the other thing is that they, if you want to give, to, they have some renovations they need to do quickly so that they can meet the new inspection guidelines as set out by Madam Moj recently. Not bad guidelines, but they just they have um, sixteen girls. And they need to make sure that they have a big enough um, space to sleep and live in. And, you know, it kind of used to be, I think, that some of the kids were younger. So the space was, but now they've gotten a little older. And they just need a little bit more space to kind of meet the square footage guidelines. And so they need to finish up a, it's a bit of a $4,000 project. So if you want to donate to that, it's at Hobie Kids, um, Venmo at Hobie Kids. It's tax deductible. It's on our description. Um, but we would love to see them get some help. We'll certainly, um, when we get home, we'll be sending money back for them for sure. They're doing some great work. Those are the kids that are going to be the next presidents and government leaders and teachers and heads of law enforcement and heads of hospitals. And those are the kids that are going to be the leaders of Liberia. And we want to make sure that they have everything that they need to do that. Yes. So they will be encouraging to be around. There's no grief there like there is. I'm sure there's grief, but there's no grief. Like the kids at the orphanage writing me letters, please find me a family as good as yours. If you think that you are like us and you are unmatched, you there's there's a seven year old little boy that you need to adopt. <laughs> and please, I please hope please live in Florida too, because yeah, there's actually several seven year old little boys. Good kids, man. Just need a shot. And there's like, I mean, the more I think about it, I'm like, ooh. We joked with our American kids tonight about how I talked about maybe adding on another kid. And my middle child says, you're not really considering that, are you? And I said, no, but you can see how when we're looking at these problems and we look at what we can do, how we want to make sure, because we do speak from a place of privilege, that we exhaust all resources to make sure that we share that privilege to make, you know, other people's lives better, too. So she took that in. She also said she thinks five is enough. She also, <laughs> well, part of that is that she always saves space for our um, fosters. So for her, she feels like she's a sibling group of eight. And so she kind of does the math on, well, what if we need to put in this one or that one? And this one has a new sibling, <clears throat> new baby brother. So what about that? And we think that our, we hope and pray that we know for sure that one of our fosters is doing fantastic. And we hope and pray that the other two are okay too. Um, we always keep room for them, but one of them for sure won't need us. <laughs> but he's um, he's good to have around. Special yeah. occasions. So. Um, but yeah, so I don't know what day this is. I think we'll end up being in Liberia for 140 days. When it's all said and done. Yikes. I still haven't booked our flight from Liberia to Ghana. I spoke with a gentleman today from the home office for Ace Guy who was kind enough to respond to my email. I've sent several. They're just not, when you're trying to reschedule something, they are not as accessible as I wish they were. But I now, if you end up in this position, I have a shortcut. I would recommend with A-Sky, if you're doing what we did, if you're going to A-Sky to Delta, it's a, good, it's a good way to do it. There's nothing wrong with it. But what I would highly recommend is just buying a one-way on the A-Sky because you can rebook. It's almost like get, catching a bus. It's pretty easy but if you're trying to reschedule a round trip ticket, it just it doesn't work on the app. So it's a little bit harder. And when you're doing international business and you're doing business out of Liberia, they just you just get flagged and your cards don't go through. And it's just a mess. But um, I spoke with a gentleman that he works with the home office, and he's not even he was he actually said I'm I'm leaving the office at this moment. I will call you when I get home. Got stuck in some traffic. Finally, I reached back out to him. And he answered me. 
and he called me and he said, he gave me my next steps and he said to keep him, um, cause he couldn't do it the way I needed it done from his house. He's like, I can't really get into that part yet. But he gave me the number and he wants me to keep him apprised of how it works out. So he's making sure, so this is that old, that old school customer service where you find somebody with a problem and you make sure that you fix the problem and then you have them tell you how it went. And so that way, if it doesn't work out, then you can, you can fix it. So. And who says customer service is dead? He was very nice. Um, I, and I, when I told him my problem, he's like, well, just go to the ticket counter and show him your ticket. I'm like, buddy, I'm in Liberia. He was like, oh. <laughs> say no more um because the airport's not open all the time and the ace got I, I mean i've been trying to call the ace got ticketing office in liberia for three days and i have not gotten anyone Dope. one of one of the numbers i called that i got off their website said that this phone was turned off or didn't have minutes or something i was like wah, wah. So, anyway i'm glad they're flying my plane <laughs> yeah. i'm sure it'll be fine so, well, one of the problems is on their app, it says there's only five tickets left for economy, and that's what we need. And I'm like, if I have to pay, like, first class out of eight for Ace Guy, it's like, I mean, I'm not, they're not going to even give me a, a warm towel. It's a two-hour flight. So, I don't know. It's the whole thing. I'll work it out. Stay tuned. That's all I got. Me too. Okay, bye. Bye.